Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Raw Show with Michael McDonald and a very special guest. We have Maria Hocking joining me today. Maria, thanks for being a guest on the show. Good to be here, Michael. Good to be here. Maria is a coach, motivational speaker and author of Strip Naked and Redress with Happiness, How to Survive and Thrive Through Personal Challenge. Having personally survived and thrived through much adversity, Maria now helps others to create change using her heart and her words. Her passion for her work is clearly evident in all that she does. Her message is clear, adversity doesn't break you, it makes you, which is definitely a good opening for a lot of talk on adversity but can we start with your background if that's okay Maria so could you share with us where you were born and what it was like for you growing up yeah okay so I was born in Fife in Scotland actually um just by chance uh, my my mother's originally from Cornwall my dad is from Norfolk um but he was working in the Royal Navy at the time and was based up in Scotland so I was born in Scotland came back to Cornwall when I was about two years old and um had a really, really lovely childhood, you know, this was the pre-technology days where we used to go and run in fields and run through, I don't know, run across the sand for days on end and just have really amazing times outdoors climbing trees and um, yeah, doing those kid things. So my, my memories of childhood are really quite, um, yeah, really, really good, happy days, lots of um, socialising, lots of friends and um, yeah, then going to my teenagers, school was great, had a great social life pretty much happy and then I guess kind of hit uncertainty at about the age of 16 to 18 as many teenagers do not really knowing who I was or what I really wanted to do in life or who I really wanted to be so yeah. So how how did you first get into deciding to be a coach was it the the first thing that you did was it something you've always done or was ah. it or, or did it come about from this like a uh, big moment that happened? Yeah, well, I mean, it's not something, I think coaching, I, you know, there aren't many coaches I know of that, that start out to be coaches at the age of 16, but it's kind of something that, yes, I was really drawn to following some of my own adversities. And, um, you know, I remember sort of being at school as a teenager, always really enjoying deep conversations with people. I love to write and I love deep conversations. Um, but no, I didn't start out as a coach. I actually went to university to train to be a PE teacher. Dropped out of uni after a year, as I felt it wasn't really what I wanted to do. Um, came home, worked as a waitress, worked at a local seal sanctuary giving public talks, um, got married, had children, that kind of thing. Um, but it was after the birth of my second child that my life completely changed overnight. And um, it was just a few weeks after sort of um, giving birth to my son that I started to lose the hair on my head. And first it used to fall out in like small clumps and then more clumps fell out and um you know i was really like quite terrified went to visit my gp who told me that it was completely normal to lose a bit of hair after giving birth but it you know obviously wasn't normal in my case because within just a few short weeks i found myself completely bald so there wow. i am um, yeah i'm a i'm a new mum i have two children and for those listening, you know, child, you know, having a young child is exhausting, as you will probably know, sleepless nights, nappy changes at 3am and all that kind of thing. So I was completely physically exhausted, but also I kind of had this thing that was happening to me. And um, I remember as my hair was falling out, I just felt that every clump of hair that disappeared, I felt as if I was losing me as well. And, you know, within just a few weeks, I'd lost my eyebrows, my eyelashes, every single hair on my head. And uh, I just felt completely and hopelessly devastated, lost. I felt like um, I'd lost all my femininity. I didn't know who I was or why I was here. And there was um, one really clear memory for me. And I just remember one morning, I was looking at my bedroom window and I had kind of my head pressed against the glass. And I was just watching everybody go to work about their daily lives, you know, toing and froing. And I just felt like this ugly, outcast, repulsive woman staring from behind this pane of glass or maybe silently screaming inside, somebody please help me. And I really was that low. Um, I was eventually referred to a consultant who diagnosed me with alopecia. And he said, there's not much we can do. Here's a prescription for a wig. And, you know, I'd gone to the hospital expecting a cure, not a wig. And I remember just wanting the ground to open up and swallow me whole at that moment. I didn't know where to turn. So that was a pretty kind of, yeah, tragic time at the time for me, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, yeah. for, 
from when you first mentioned it, um, alarm bells are going off in my head a little bit, but it it wasn't as as bad as I guess as, as I thought it was because um, I, I I tend to think of her loss as being cancer related. See, yeah, as, as, as you mentioned it, my head was like, oh, she didn't, yeah. did she? But yeah. no, it, was it was it just was it? I say just. It, 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 what wasn't cancer related was it? No, it wasn't cancer related at all. Just alopecia. So basically, it, you know, it's um, an immune disorder. Basically, in the hair decides to just fall out, and um, maybe it was caused by the hormones from the birth, or no one is really, really knows. So no one's really sure. So, and you know, I look back, and I'm very fortunate that it wasn't cancer. But um, nothing could have prepared me for how something like losing your hair could affect you psychologically. If that makes sense, nothing would have ever prepared me for that. But um, and, you know, I had to quit my job as a waitress because my hair was falling into food and people were staring at me. Uh, and the hardest thing was people started treating me differently. You know, I, I tried to go on as I was. I tried to live this normal life. And I tried to continue going to the school playground to pick up my three-year-old daughter from preschool. But people who had spoken to me before would just turn their backs on me. And they just literally completely ignored me, probably because they didn't know what to say to me, you know, or, you know whether it was cancer, I guess. Um, so my life completely shut down, literally shut down. I wouldn't go out of the house. I was literally terrified to leave the house. But then there was one day that it all changed and it's a really memorable day in my life. And um, I was at home and I'd been crying all morning, feeling sorry for myself. And I had a wig by this point, but you know, I still didn't know who I was with the wig. Um, and I was at home one day and I just happened to see my daughter playing with my baby son in the dining room. And she was just, flicking the back of the baby bouncer that he was in and he was like giggling and you know that kind of laugh that babies have is so deep and it's a real belly chuckle yeah. I just yeah do you know what I mean that kind of like real sort of like oh there's no, I don't know how quite to describe it but I'm sure only babies are capable of it but um <laughs> I, <laughs> but I remember in that moment I had tears pouring down my face and I just heard this laughter and I turned and I saw and I watched and in that moment, I realized that I had been so busy focusing on what I'd lost, as in my hair, I had totally forgotten what I did have in my life. And the only way that I can describe that moment, oh, wow, it was just so powerful. Um, it's like an overwhelming sense of gratitude. And it was almost like this beam of light filled me from the top of my head to the tips of my toes. And in that moment, I felt hope. And in that moment of hope, I knew I couldn't change what happened to me, but I knew that I needed to change me, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, there's, you often talk of, well, I say you often talk, we often hear that um, it's not about what happens to us, it's about what we do about what happens to us. And yeah. I, I saw, um, I can't remember how long ago it was, was it was either a documentary about um, psychology and they were like, well, we're not broken. We just need to improve what we already have because we often have yeah. this this idea that we're broken, don't we? We often have like, yeah. There's something wrong with us. We're not right. We need to change things. And yeah. so, sometimes that, that can cause a lot, of, a lot of negativity for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think sometimes, you know, saying that is, when we go through stuff in life, we look for things to change externally, don't we? We're looking for someone else to blame or we're looking for someone else to change or someone else to change things for us. But I truly believe it's not until we go within that we find our answers and that we find our power. And so for me, in that moment of gratitude, that was when I probably for the first time in my life, I'm being really honest, stepped into my power. And, you know, so for me, reflecting and looking internally made me realise that I needed something else to think about apart from me. So that led to me booking onto a fitness instructor course, believe it or not. And um, I trained to be a fitness instructor wearing my wig, which was pretty terrifying at first. But actually, that was one of the biggest fears that I faced. And, um, you know, I trained to be a fitness instructor over a, a few months and not only started to find my confidence back again, but started to find a higher level of confidence, if that makes sense. And, you know, by the end of that course, I went out and I started at my, my own business as a fitness instructor. So bear in mind, I've been at rock bottom, you know, sort of ready to kind of end my life. And now I've turned my life around because I've been focusing on different things. And, you know, gratitude, gratitude was the thing that helped me to turn it around to start with. Then focus, that's my I guess, second top tip. Focus is key because sometimes we need to think about positive things to fill our mind with different things to help us deal with things that we're going through. And, you know, that really restored so much of my confidence. But 
yeah, what I really discovered was that I had started to find me for the first time in my whole entire life. I was doing a job that I loved as a fitness instructor. I was motivating people. I was inspiring people. And I also started using my wig as a branding tool, believe it or not, because I, I wanted to like grow my business and, and have more classes. And I thought, what's my unique selling point? And obviously it was my wig. So I wrote to all the local newspapers. I wrote to radio stations. I got interviews. I got lots of free publicity because I was the only wig wearing fitness instructor around. <laughs> <laughs> So my class has literally boomed, you know, my business literally went crazy because of that. And I'm very, very fortunate for that. So, and that was when I realized we have the power to turn around what's happened to us, but not only turn it around, but use it as well. And that was all really because cool. of the wig, all because of the wig, you know, so, and then, so, so I did that for quite a few years, 16 years in total. Um, in the middle of that, I got chronic fatigue syndrome, um, which wiped me out for a year. Um, so I had to kind of almost reduce my business back to nothing, rehabilitate, and then pick myself up again. And then I guess the next biggest thing that happened to me was I was about 35 years old. My business was booming yet again. I had lots and lots of fitness classes, and I started to get pain in my hip. Really like severe, severe pain. And I kept going to GPs and physiotherapists and, you know, didn't get a lot of help. Um, the problem continued. So one night after a fitness class, I drove myself to A&E at the local hospital and I said, there is something wrong with my hip, please help me. And I genuinely expected to get, you know, to got, to get turned away. It's a bit of a time waster, you know, but they x-rayed me and they told me at the age of 35 that I had hip dysplasia and that I would need a major surgery to correct it and that I would be out of work for probably about a year. And that is not the news I expected to hear, you know, um, which completely floored me again you know I just when fitness is your job and your career and how you built your life back and found your confidence to have it kind of ripped away it was you know initially devastating but what I did realize is that you know I'd been through tough stuff before I mean losing my hair was pretty severe at the time but I knew that I'd re rebuilt my life yeah so I decided that I needed one again gratitude I started to focus on what I did have not what I didn't have and then I started to change my focus again and realized that actually the year that I had to take out from the fitness industry, industry gave me the wonderful opportunity to pursue um, a coaching career and to study more about coaching, which I did. So it was incredible. I did a lot of my coach training actually um, in a wheelchair and on crutches, which was, uh, yeah, it was, it was challenging, but it gave me a lot of time to read, to research and to really totally immerse myself in personal transformation and but you know I think I put my husband through hell on being completely honest because um, <laughs> the operation involved like breaking my hip socket into three pieces and then screwing it back together again so it was in a bit of a better shape and um, the operation took nine hours and I had like heaps of metal staples running right down my hip and my leg and I'd been out of hospital for only about three days and um, I was really bored at home. You know, my body was not working at all, but my mind was going stir crazy. So I said to my husband, this coaching course is going on in three days time, you know, 80 miles away um, in this little wooden lodge at the top of this icy hill up in Devon. And I said to my husband, can you drop me there? Just drive me up there because I couldn't drive and just drop me to this, in this, this lodge near all this ice in this wheelchair. And I said, I'll just ask for help because I really need to do this course. And he said, no, you crazy woman, you know, you've just had a nine hour operation. There's not a hope in hell I'm doing that. But <laughs> I just went on and on and on. And in the end, he gave in oh. and he dropped, he dropped me to the course in this wheelchair. And it was the first time in my life that I realized asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. So I had to ask a lot of people over the next few days to help me in the wheelchair, wheel me up and down back to and from the course every day, you know, and go and get my lunch for me, all these things. But unless I asked for help, I would never have been able to achieve that. So it was a real significant time in my life when I realized that things happen to us, but it doesn't, they don't have to define our life. And if we can turn them around and if we can use them and find something positive within them, then our lives can be phenomenal, if that makes sense. So, so yeah. And so, you know, that was when my, at that point I was so thirsty for more information to do with personal development and it was at that point that I realized that my own adversities had given me so much knowledge to help other people like you know an incredible amount of knowledge 
so I had like these coaching qualifications and NLP qualifications, but what really drove me was my absolute desire to help other people overcome difficult situations because I knew that it was possible and I was walking, talking proof that, you know, what I was going to teach worked, if that makes sense. Is it just a case of changing the words that we're using in order to change what we're focusing on? Because a lot of it, a lot of it does seem to stem from this idea of focusing on something good as opposed to something that's not so great. But is it just yeah. a case of changing the words that we're using and changing the conversations that we're having or is it a bit more to it? Well, definitely changing the words. Um, I think the beliefs have got a lot to do with it. Um, so changing what you're believing about that situation, if that makes sense. So, for example, you know, when I was diagnosed with hip dysplasia initially, it, you know, I believed it was the worst possible thing that could happen to me being a fitness instructor. Um, but what I had to do was change my belief about that and think, OK, what if this was the best possible thing? How could I use it, if that makes sense? So we need to change the words. But underneath that, we need to change our beliefs about the situation. Um, definitely. And I think it's the beliefs. Um, and sometimes we have to physically you know, force ourselves to change those beliefs. And even if we're still feeling a bit unsure, just by repeating those words to ourselves, you know, there is some good in this situation. I have to find the good in this situation because if we're just using the words, this is the worst possible thing that's happened to me. We're not going to look for the good things and we're not going to notice the good things, if that makes sense. But by changing our beliefs about that, we are, we'll start to look for new things and we'll start to get new opportunities because of that. Does it? just work one way so like you mentioned the words and the beliefs and things and is it a particular way around that it would ideally work so is it beliefs that come first or is it the words that come first I mean, what way around would you see it i would say it's the beliefs come first i think maybe we have to look at the well i think we have to go start with the words we have to look at our words and then we have to think what is making us say those words what is making us think those words so i think our beliefs are identified by the language that we're using. So we look at the language and then we think, how can I say this or think about this differently? Go down to the belief level, then come back up to the words again, but change those words if that makes sense. So fundamentally, the words give away the belief, but the words on their own aren't enough, if that makes sense. So we have to look at the clues, the words, the words give us clues, basically, to how we're really thinking and processing underneath. And when we get into that thinking and processing and believing and what we're believing, then we can change our words and come back up again. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I like the idea of um, the words. I like the, the clues for the beliefs yeah. and you can then use the words to sort of go in and, and change them. I quite like that. So what, what happened next after the, well, the unfortunate hip dysplasia? <laughs> Yeah, so that was, you know, that was obviously, it took me a long while to recover from that. I'm not going to lie. It was a very painful process, but also a gift. But um, so, you know, I was kind of, I went back to my fitness career, the hip went wrong again, and then I had to have my hip replaced at 37. So I was like really super, super young to have a hip replacement. And I actually had to fight to have that done because not a lot of surgeons would go near me, to be fair, because I was so young, because the hip joints, you know, might not last that long. But my life was so compromised. I was in so much pain. I could barely walk most days. So I elected to go for a hip replacement, which then gave me back, um, you know, a lot of my life again. And I wasn't in any pain, which was really, really great. So, so by then I was coaching sort of full time. I, uh, I decided to give up the fitness career around about that point because I was still suffering with a little bit of pain in my hips. I decided just to throw myself fully 100% into my coaching career. Um, and it was phenomenal, you know, new opportunities started to come in, more work started to come in, everything opened up for me and it was really, really amazing. And I really got to put my whole heart and soul into what I love doing, which is changing lives with my heart and my words. And um, it was about three years ago where um, I suddenly got this insane desire to share my message with more people. And my coaching practice was like at maximum. I couldn't work with any more clients. I'm, you know, I'm still to this day fully booked all the time, which is really, really great. But I just wanted to find a way to share my message with more people. And I knew three years ago, the only way to do that was to write a book. So I had this idea for this book and the title came to me just one day at Birmingham airport, literally just in a flash. And I knew the title was right, um, which was Strip Naked and Redress with Happiness. Because, um, you know, going back to the origins of my story, that I literally felt naked when I lost my hair, not just physically, but emotionally as well. And I think that adversity, you know, has the ability to strip us naked. 
but actually when we are naked we find our truth and then we get to rebuild who we really are so i got the title of this book and i started to write the book and then we had the biggest one of the biggest blows of all if i'm being totally honest with you um my husband was diagnosed with a really rare genetic disorder about three years ago totally out of the blue and he began to lose his sight he has got a condition called pxe which is pseudoxanthoma elasticum quite a complicated sort of title but it causes calcification a lot of the elastic tissue in the body and you know very you know with a short amount of time he began to lose his sight and um, we went to the hospital and because his condition is so so rare most of the gps have never heard of it so we had to do our own research and we had to you know contact people all over the world to ask for help and it was a really really tough time we kept going back to the hospital and saying you know his eyesight's deteriorating and they examined him and said we couldn't find any they, they couldn't see um anything wrong at the back of his eye but what was happening was that there, there were little bleeds that happened at the back of the eye with his condition and he was obviously seeing them uh, through his own eyes but they were so small they couldn't be picked up by the hospital machinery and um uh, we, got you. Yeah, and it, it got really, really super bad. He, you know, he was, you know, it started off as little sight loss and it got massive sight loss and even bigger sight loss. And we were literally had no help. It was like devastating, you know, watching my husband lose his sight and feeling like there was no help for us was, oh, it was, it was you know, at the time it was terrible. But um, then we went back to hospital yet again for probably about the seventh time. And it was about the seventh time they did pick up a bleed in his eye. And we were like really super relieved because we heard that if they could identify a bleed, then he could have an injection, which would then hopefully help the sight loss, if that makes sense. So we're really delighted that they found a bleed so they can actually treat him. But then they said to us, because his condition is so rare, um, funding hasn't been agreed for his condition. We don't know if we can get funding. And the injections that he needed to go into his eyes were about eight between 800 and 1,000 pound each um, cost you know, for the NHS. Um, so we were told that you know, my husband had this condition, that he was losing his sight, and basically we didn't know if anybody could help us. And wow, that was a, that was a blow for the whole family, as you can imagine. And um, I, there, were, there were a couple of moments that really stick in my mind. And there was one, and we were standing at the side of a football pitch with our teenage son, and he was playing football. And my husband just turned to me and said, I can't see which one is our son anymore. And, you know, just hearing those words, oh, it felt like my, you know, stomach and heart had been ripped out. It was so sad. And that very same day, I caught him standing out in the garden on our decking, looking up, looking at, looking up at the sky um, in the dark. And he had just these tears pouring down his face because the stars were beginning to disappear. And you know, that is like, whoa, it was, you know, even thinking about that now, it's, whoa, it was a really, really difficult time. Um, but to, we didn't know what else to do, but we just knew that we couldn't change anything there and then that moment. So our daughter was working as a volunteer teacher in Thailand at the time. She was over there for a year. So we literally took our other two children, put on our backpacks and went to Thailand, jumped on a plane and decided to go out there and just switch off a bit for a couple of a weeks traveled from one end of Thailand to the other had the most amazing amazing holiday my husband's sight was still obviously really really bad at the time but you know we look back and we only experienced that Thailand and that amazingness because of his condition and um, what we realized during that trip to Thailand was that his condition was actually a gift in so many ways because it made us realize what was really important in life it like slammed us right back into our values you know overnight and all the little rounds we used to bicker about the bickering that we did and the little tiny things that seemed important before didn't seem important anymore and we realized the most important thing in our lives were family friends fun and adventure and that was a really overwhelming feeling really really overwhelming so and um yeah so then we came back to the uk and funding to, to our absolute delight funding had been secured and he has had injections which has restored most of his sight um, he struggles driving at night. Um, we have no idea what the future holds with this site. It probably doesn't look particularly good, but we hope um, that, you know, it lasts a bit longer. Um, but all these things have given us such massive hope um, in so many ways and, and brought so much richness, richness to our lives. And, you know, as he was diagnosed, that was when I was starting to write my book, just to go back to where I started with this. And um, I knew that I had to include his story within the pages of my book. 
And it's really, it's a final powerful chapter of my book and it's all about values and all about living life by what's really important to us. Um, and I like to see values as stars. And if we're not living life along, amongst our own stars, then we'll never shine. But actually, PXC, his condition, has given us a massive gift of knowledge in that we are happiest living amongst our own stars. And that's a very strong message that I share with many, many people on a daily basis. Well, thanks for, thanks for sharing the, the story, Maria. I mean, it can't have been easy at the time. I mean, I, I can just tell by, by how easy it was for you to really say that and relay that means you, you kind of got, got past that a little bit. Like, what, oh, what, yeah. what are things like at the minute? Oh, things are really good. Absolutely. You know, do you know what? Our lives have never been happier. And I say that from the bottom of my heart. You know, so I don't want to paint this to be like a really negative story because it's far from that. Because we are living amazing lives now because of it. You know, because of all my adversities and my husband's challenge. What we've come to realise is that through all of those things, there have been these wonderful, wonderful gifts. And I will honestly say, even though my husband struggles with his eyes and lots of other health complications as a result of his condition, it's made us so much happier, not only individually, but as a couple and as a family, you know? We were happy before, but now we are much happier because we, we work less, we spend more time with family and friends, we go on holiday more, we go to the cinema more, we do the things that we love more. And, um, but that's how we should all be living anyway, Margaret, you know? We, we should all be living like this anyway. Uh, we don't have to wait for like a tsunami or a bereavement or a divorce or an illness to begin to live our lives in a spectacular way so i truly believe that what's happened to us and to me and to our family as a whole um has was meant to happen i believe that it was meant to happen that's the way that i see it because we were meant to spread the word and we were meant to help people live the lives that they really truly deserve to be living um, and all the knowledge that we've gained along the way have given us massive massive gifts to help us do that and you know i couldn't coach as i coach now if i hadn't been through all that stuff and if my hus husband hadn't been through that stuff i wouldn't have the knowledge and the passion that i have this insane passion to make sure that everybody that i meet you know lives their potential yeah <clears throat> i mean I, I completely agree with that it's almost like it's almost like it gets a lot easier when when we do live that way like it just makes our lives so much simpler and yeah. it's easier for us to achieve the things that we want as soon as we, we realize what those things are yeah absolutely and like i say it all comes down to the values what's really important to you in life and um you know we all ignore our values at times in our lives i'm sure you'll agree we'll all have done jobs that we're not happy with we'll all have spent time with people that don't really fire us up um and we just kind of you know on the treadmill of life but actually you know we it was you know we got off the treadmill because of what we've been through if that makes sense and um yeah we our priorities have completely completely changed and it you know and we are supremely happy and it doesn't mean that there are days that we aren't challenged absolutely and that's normal in life everybody goes through challenges and some, some days things go wrong for us all occasionally and it's not about being perfect all the time it's not about being you know literally smiley every single minute of every single day I totally believe that we should try and be as smiley as possible for as long as we can every single day. Um, when stuff goes wrong, we allow ourselves to feel the pain. We allow ourselves to wallow in self-pity for a day, a week, maybe a couple of months. But what's really important is that we don't stay there, that we refuse to stay there and we get up and we rise and we use what we've been through. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it's just something that, that I just echo. I mean, it's um, it's definitely a process. It's definitely something that is worth going through if if yeah. you want the if you want life to be that little bit smoother. So how yeah. how did things change for you after you wrote the book? So you shared a lot about what goes into the book and everything else, yeah. but what happened afterwards? Well, um, so it was published like a year ago now. So it's been a crazy, crazy past year but an amazing amazing year and you know just i'll tell you what the well the, when my book was first published since then, i mean obviously i had a whole box box full of books arrived about a year ago with my own story in it you know and just opening that box and seeing my story and knowing it was going to help so many people was just like phenomenal for me i literally collapsed the floor like a sobbing wreck you know it is absolutely hysterics but obviously very very delighted and very very happy so you know i've been traveling the uk a lot i've been speaking a lot um, sharing my knowledge about the book and promoting the book 
um, doing various exhibits, showing, you know, various shows, things like that. But it's, it, I, it's been a, an amazing year. I'm still coaching a lot. I'm writing my second book now as well. But I think since, since my book has come out, it's just, um, it's just made me even happier because my book is now starting to sell sort of globally and I'm getting emails from people all over the world telling me how much my story has changed their life. So it's just like this kind of amazing knock-on effect and um, it only fuels me more. It fuels me more to continue to spread the word. It fuels me more to keep on promoting the book and it fuels me more to keep coaching. So it's been, uh, yeah, I've literally been all over the UK this year traveling. You know, it's been a really, really super, super busy year. Um, but absolutely incredible, yeah. All right, well, last couple of questions for you then, Maria. I mean, we yeah. are, we are reason we've covered quite a lot, so I'm quite actually quite surprised you've covered as much as we have. But right. um, aside from your book, which is Strip Naked and Redress with Happiness, How to Survive and Thrive Through Personal Challenge, have you yeah. got any other books that you would recommend to people or even books that you've actually gifted yourself? Well, one of my favourite books, I only bought it a few months ago. I don't know if you've read it, Michael. It's called The Book of Joy. Have you heard of that? I've heard of it, but I haven't read it yet. Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. It is the most incredible book I have ever read. And, you know, I'm a very, very big, big reader. I My bookshelves are bending at home. I have probably, I've read well over a thousand sort of books very, very similar to that. Um, but within the pages of that, it, it just it's just like the... The, the, the keys the keys to life or within those pages and that's it's just such a beautiful beautiful book so deep so heartfelt and I think it will resonate with everybody who reads it I also like oh so so many um oh um have you heard of oh, I've forgotten his surname now um the guy with no arms and no legs Nick I can never pronounce his surname I think it's something like Voyagech is it something like that yeah I, mean, I, yeah I couldn't pronounce it either but yeah it does sound about right yeah, his books are amazing. I've read a couple of his. Um, I think there's one with the words no limits in it, but he, as an author and his books are incredible because it really puts your life into perspective. But another one that is really blew me away, which I read about a year ago, is called On Fire. Um, that is absolutely spectacular. And I, right now, I've forgotten the name of the guy um, that wrote it, um, but I'll give you a brief sort of overview. Basically, he was really severely badly burnt as a child um, within his garage, I think it came with fuel or petrol and just wanted to end his life. And his story is just absolutely phenomenal. That book touched me really, really well, you know, so much, so, so much. So, uh, you know, all the books I've read over the years, On Fire, definitely. And um, The Book of Joy, two of the top ones and the ones by Nick Boyajic. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong for anybody who's <laughs> listening, but it's a guy with no arms and no legs. <laughs> yeah. Ap apologies to Nick if, if he ever gets to listen yeah, to Yeah, I'm really book. sorry, Nick, but yeah. <laughs> All right, if someone wanted to find out a bit more about you, Maria, so this is your chance to share links and websites. Where can people go? Yeah, well, my website is um, www.mariahocking, <coughs> H-O-C-K-I-N-G, dot com. Um, you can email me at info at mariahocking.com. Um, you can also check out my YouTube channel. I've got lots of inspirational videos on there, so check out Maria Hocking. Um, on YouTube, um, Instagram as well, Maria Hockey UK Life Changer, and on Twitter. So yeah, there's plenty of places to find me, plenty of places to hear me speaking further and sharing my knowledge. So yeah. All right, sounds good. So got one last question for you, Maria, which is one that I ask everybody. So this is something that we can kind of open the whole thing up a bit now. So we don't have to talk about what we've spoken about before. We can okay. dive into something else. All right. We've had funny answers. We've had serious answers. Okay. And, okay. Uh, and the question is, what would you like the world to know about you that it doesn't already know? Oh, wow. That's a deep one. I like that. What would I like the world to know about me that it doesn't already know? Um, okay, um, let me think, let me think. So the first, okay, I'm going to go with a bit of a, I'm, I'm super untidy. Like, I'm really mega, mega untidy. I hold my hands up. I'm really superbly messy. Housework is not my skill, and I try, and but I have far more exciting things in my life to do, and I get very easily distracted. So, yes, yeah, so behind all my, um, my website and my Facebook and all those types of things, yes, you'll find me at home normally surrounded by washing and yes yes yeah. so I'm really super untidy that's the that's one thing the world should know about me I'm a normal person I'm super super untidy um and what else should they know about me they don't already know 
oh, that's, ooh. I think that's really, really tricky because I'm such a transparent person and I share a lot on social media. So I think the world probably does know pretty much everything about me. Um, if there's anything that they didn't know. Um, oh, I like to monofin. There we go. You like what, sorry? Monofinning. Do you, have you heard of monofinning? Basically, I, I haven't, no. I basically, so I like to go to the swimming pool and it's like a big double flipper that you put on your feet. Okay, um, so it's like it's like flippers, but they're joined together, just like a mermaid tail. Oh, yeah, and I love to swim with my monofin, so that's something nobody really knows about me. But it's one of my guilty pleasures, and you'll quite often find me in the pool under the water feeling like Ariel the mermaid. So, there, <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. All right, Maria, thanks for, for being a guest on the show. I really appreciate you taking awesome the time, and I'm sure we'll, we'll, sure we'll keep in touch. Okay, brilliant, thank you very much.